Good evening and welcome to our Memorial Day program. We are gathered here tonight to honor those who have died in service to their country. We are to remember their achievements, their courage, and their dedication, and to say thank you for their sacrifices. Thinking of the heroes who join us in this group tonight and those who are here only in spirit, a person cannot help but feel awed by the enormity of what we encounter. We stand in the midst of patriots and the family and friends of those who have nobly served. Millions of Americans have fought and died on battlefields here and abroad to defend our freedoms and way of life. Today our troops continue to make the ultimate sacrifices and even as we lose troops, more Americans step forward to say, I'm ready to serve. They follow in the footsteps of generations of fine Americans. Please rise for the processional, the posting of the colors, and please remain standing during the national anthem. Join us in the singing of the Star Spangled Banner. Members of the Eveleth and Gilbert Veterans Organizations, band and choir members, parents, family, friends, community members, and guests. On behalf of the Duchamos chapter of the Eveleth Gilbert Senior High School Minnesota Honor Society, I would like to welcome you to this very special tribute for Memorial Day, a sacred day to all war veterans. History of Memorial Day. The following are John Shepler's words from a positive light. Memorial Day, perhaps more than any other holiday, was born of human necessity. Deep inside all of us lies a fundamental desire to make sense of life and our place in it and the world. What we have been given, what we will do with it, and what we will pass on to the next generation is all part of an unfolding history, a continuum that links one soul to another. In its early years, Memorial Day was known as Decoration Day when graves were decorated with flowers and garlands. Although there are many stories of how Memorial Day actually began, it is thought that May 30th was chosen as the date because it was the anniversary of the discharge of the last Union volunteer of the Civil War. As early as 1866, the patriotic dead of the Civil War were honored in Waterloo, New York. Memorial Day was officially proclaimed on May 5th, 
1868, by General John Logan, National Commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, in his General Order No. 11. It was first observed on May 30th, 1868, when flowers were placed on the graves of Union and Confederate soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery. The South refused to acknowledge the day until after World War I, when the holiday changed from honoring just those who died fighting in the Civil War to honoring all Americans who died fighting in any war. Memorial Day was observed on May 30th until 1968, when Congress moved the holiday to the last Monday in May. Tradition of the poppy. Way back during the Napoleonic Wars, the poppy drew attention as the mysterious flower that bloomed over the graves of fallen soldiers. In the 20th century, the poppy again was widely noticed after soils in France and Belgium became rich in lime from rumble during the First World War. The little red flowers flourished around the graves of the war dead as they had 100 years earlier. In 1915, Ontario native John McRae, a doctor serving with the Canadian Forces Artillery, recorded this phenomenon of the red flowers in his famous poem in Flanders Field. In 1915, inspired by this poem, Moina Michael replied with her own poem. We cherish too the poppy red that grows on the fields where the valor led. It seems to signal to the skies that blood of heroes never dies. She then conceived of an idea to wear red poppies on Memorial Day in honor of those who died serving the nation during war. She was the first to wear one and sold poppies to her friends and co-workers with the money going to benefit servicemen in need. And so the poppy came to represent the symbol of remembrance. We would like to thank the Eveleth and Gilbert Ladies Auxiliaries for providing us with the poppies to share tonight. As they are distributed, I will read McCray's famous poem, In Flanders Fields, that inspired Moina Michael. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow, between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing, fly, skates heard amid the guns below, we are the dead, short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie. In Flanders fields, take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high, if ye, ye break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. In Flanders fields the poppies blow Between the crosses row on row That mark our place and in the sky The lark still bravely singing fly Oh 
Memorial Day is not just a time for honoring those men and women who died serving in uniform during wartime to preserve the freedoms that we cherish today. It is also time to remember the hundreds of individuals that have been listed as prisoners of war and those designated as missing in action. For their loved ones, there is no peace, no final resting place. You may have noticed a small table over there set in a place of honor. It is set for one. This table is our way of recognizing those who are missing from our midst. They are unable to be here with us, and so we remember them also. This table set for one is small. It symbolizes the frail frailty of one prisoner against his oppressors. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intention to respond to their country's call to arms. The single rose displayed in a vase reminds us of the families and loved ones of our comrades in arms who keep faith awaiting their return. The red ribbon tied so prominently on the vase is reminiscent of the red ribbons worn upon the lapel and breast of the thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination to demand a proper accounting for our missing. A slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate. Their assault upon the bread plate, symbolic of the family tears as they wait. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us tonight. The chair. The chair is empty. They are not here. Remember, all of you who served with them and called them comrades, who depended on their might and aid and relied upon them, do not forsake them. Pray for them and remember them. Heroes unaware. I first saw him on a park bench. I've seen him every day, sitting in a shady grove where my children come to play. Sometimes he feeds the birds and squirrels or whittles little toys. Sometimes he just sits and smiles at the laughing girls and boys. And I never paid him any mind till one day just this year, I noticed that he wore a frown and on his cheek a tear. Well, I asked him why he seemed so down. He looked up, began to say, I lost half my friends 60 years ago today. He told me of the terror as he fought to reach dry land by the time the beachhead was secure, half his friends lay in the sand. That was just in one long day. He fought on for four more years. And in the 60 years from then to now, have not dimmed his sights of war. He said they have reunions just to keep in touch and share. And for each comrade who has gone on, they leave an empty chair. Well, his park bench has been empty now, about six months or so. And if I never looked, took the time that I never would have known. That sitting on that simple bench with breadcrumbs and little toys was a man who gave his all to guarantee my daily joys. So give thanks to all the men and women who are still here or have gone before and made the highest sacrifice in both peace and time and in war. Because they bought our freedom, paid their own blood, sweat, and tears, then endured the heartache of those empty chairs for all these years. So please do not ignore them or speed by without a care, because you never know when you might pass by a hero unaware. Thank you for attending our program tonight. This fall, I was given the privilege of representing Minnesota's 8th District in the VFW's Voice of Democracy essay contest. The prompt for this year was, why does my vote matter? Voting, it is a right for all American citizens, a right that far too many of us take for granted. In our last presidential election, three quarters of American adults did not cast a vote. The same three quarters of adults have also been some of the president's largest critics. While, yes, not voting is also a way of participating in our democracy, there can also be some very harmful effects on the population as well as our government. I will explore the effects that voting has on the citizens of the United States, 
the effects that voting, or lack thereof, has on our government, and why voting matters to me personally. Voting can be a very powerful thing. Picture this. If every single American, except for one individual, decided not to vote, what would happen? There is potential that it could be something great, a representative, member of Congress, or even a small town mayor that truly had the best interests of our country in mind. It would not follow a part strict partisan agenda and do only what they felt was moral and constitutional. At the same time, it could be something awful. We could have a leader that sent us back into times of segregation, ruin our economy and cause a second Great Depression, or potentially launch us into World War III. It might just be my personal thoughts, but I certainly feel that this is too much power for any one individual to have. Obviously, this wouldn't happen, and it is a worst-case scenario, but it is terrifying to think about voting in that way. The effects that a leader has on their people can be wonderful, awful, or both. By voting, we get to pick a candidate that we think will be the best, but my political views are different from yours, and yours are different from the person next to you. We get the option to make our voice heard, but so many throw this chance away. Our government is split in two. It's black and white, or rather red and blue. The goal of the Democratic Republic is to make sure that everyone is able to voice their own opinion and vote on the matter. If we choose not to vote, we choose not to use our voice. When we give up our voice, a small few would be able to rule. If only a small few have total control, we would essentially lose our rights as a democratic country. Our free nation would become an oligarchy or possibly a communist country. By choosing to vote, the many people with many differing opinions are able to continue to share their stances. If we stop voting, there is great potential that we would fall victim to one political party or style, likely for the rest of our time. Voting is a deeply personal thing to many people. When I was younger, we held mock presidential elections, and we were told to keep quiet about who we voted for. The teachers, teachers told us that who we voted for was for only us to know. I just assumed that it was a rule and that we could not share who we voted for. Unfortunately, I was not the only one who thought this way. It became something that we could not talk to our family about or have a conversation with our friends about. Even today, if I get into a political discussion with a classmate, I get funny looks from others because I'm sharing my opinions. Politics should not be something that we are afraid to speak about. It's a right for all Americans, and if we do not exercise this right, we will lose it. Free speech and the right to vote are not something that very many citizens internationally have the luxury of. We have been beyond blessed with the way that our founding fathers set up our government. They gave us the ideas, abilities, and the power to run our country the way we feel it should be run. There are uncountable reasons that I am thankful for my life in the United States. For many people, voting for the first time is not that big a deal. For me, I feel that in modern times especially, it is more important to vote now than ever. I cannot wait until I am able to support candidates who I believe that believe in the same things as I, in more ways than just speaking about them to my peers. Voting is a big deal, and we need to treat it that way. I will continue to urge my peers to speak out on matters that are important to them, and begin to get them excited for, for the future that we hold in our hands, we are the future, and if we cannot protect our basic rights and what we stand for, what is the point of even trying to make the world a better place? A quote by Sharon Salzberg that really speaks to me and I hope will resonate with you as well. Voting is the expression of our commitment to ourselves, one another, this country, and this world. The, mean, the meaning of Memorial Day. Sacrifice is meaningless without remembrance. America's collective consciousness demands that all citizens be aware and recall on special occasions the deaths of their fellow countrymen during wartime. Far too often, the nation as a whole takes for granted the freedoms all Americans enjoy. These freedoms were paid for with the lives of others few of us actually knew. So that's why we remember all of them on one special day. 
By honoring the nation's war dead, we preserve their memory and thus their service and, sac and the sacrifice for the United States of America. Our nation mourns the loss of all Americans who de died defending their country throughout the world since 1775. Most Americans are familiar with the major wars, but few think of those killed in minor frays. No American death is too insignificant to remember, however, when that life was lost at the behest of society. In other words, the death of a sailor in the Gulf is every bit as important as the one killed in the Pacific during World War II. These are men and women who have remained mostly anonymous except to the families who loved them. They came from all walks of life and all regions of the country, but they all had one thing in common, the love and loyalty they felt for their country. Who were they? They were relatives, friends, and neighbors, melted together to perform a service for an entire society. They were the nation's defenders. I am the flag by Ruth Apperson Rose. I am the flag of the United States of America. I was born on June 14, 1777 in Philadelphia. There, the Continental Congress adopted my stars and stripes as a national flag. My 13 stripes alternating red and white with a union of 13 white stars in a field of blue represented a new constellation, a new nation dedicated to the personal and religious liberty of mankind. Today, 50 stars signal from my union for one each of the 50 sovereign states in the greatest constitutional republic the world has ever known. My colors symbolize the patriotic ideals and spiritual qualities of the citizens of my country. My red stripes proclaim the fearless courage and integrity of the American men and boys and the self-sacrifice and devotion of the American mothers and daughters. My white stripes stand for liberty and equality for all. My blue is the blue of heaven, loyalty, and faith. I represent these eternal principles, liberty, justice, and humanity. I embody American freedom, freedom of speech, religion, assembly, the press, and the sanctity of the home. I typify the, that indomitable spirit of, of determination brought to my land by Christopher Columbus and by all my forefathers, the pilgrims, Puritans, settlers at Jamestown, at Jamestown and Plymouth. I am as old as my nation. I am a living, symbol of my nation's law, the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights. I voice Abraham Lincoln's philosophy, a government for the people, by the people, for the people. I stand guard over my nation's school, the seedbed of good citizenship and true patriotism. I'm displayed in every schoolroom throughout my nation. Every schoolyard has a flagpole for my display. Daily, thousands upon thousands of boys and girls pledge their allegiance to me and my country. I have my own law. Public Law 829, the Flag Code, which definitely states my correct use and display for all occasions and situations. I have my special day, Flag Day. June 14th is set aside to honor my birth. Americans, I am the sacred emblem of your country. I symbolize your birthright, your, her your heritage of liberty purchased with blood and sorrow. I am your title deed of, of freedom, which is yours to enjoy and hold and trust for prosperity. If you, fa if you fail to keep this sacred trust inviolate, I, if I am nullified and destroyed, you and your children will become slaves to dictators and despots. Eternal vigilance is your price of freedom. As you see me silhouetted against the peaceful skies of my country, remind yourself that I am the flag of your country and, I s and that I stand for what you are, no more, no less. Guard me well, lest your freedom perish from the earth. Dedicate your lives to those principles for which I stand. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I was created in freedom. I made my first appearance in a battle for human liberty. God grant that I may spend eternity in my land of the free and the home of the brave, and that I shall ever be known as Old Glory, the flag of the United States of America. Freedom is not free. I watched the flag pass by one day. It fluttered in the breeze. A young Marine saluted it, and then he stood at ease. I looked at him in uniform, so young, so tall, so proud. With hair cut squared and eyes alert, he'd stand out in any crowd. I thought how many men like him had fallen through the years, how many died on foreign soil, how many mother's tears, 
how many pilots' planes shot down, how many foxholes were soldiers' graves. No, freedom is not free. I heard the sound of tabs playing one night when everyone was still. I listened to the bugler play and felt a sudden chill. I wondered how many times taps had been played that meant amen when a flag was draped a a coffin over a brother or a friend. I thought of all the children, of the mothers and wives, of fathers, sons, and husbands with interrupted lives. I thought about graveyards at the bottom of the sea, of unmarked graves at Arlington. No, freedom is not free. Yes, the people of the United States of America are free, but freedom takes sacrifice, and it is the men and women of the armed forces who make the sacrifice for us all. Many of them have paid their lives in places like Valley Forge, the Alamo, Guadalcanal, and Vietnam. Many of these people who devote their lives of their lifetime often go unnoticed. Before the band tribute to four of the branches of the military, let us recognize those of you here tonight who are members or who have been members of our military units and protective services. Members of the National Guard, please stand. Members of law enforcement, police, sheriff, state troopers, and anyone else who have guarded our safety, please stand. Firefighters, paramedic, first responders, and emergency medical technicians, please stand.
on May 3rd, 2000, the Office of Press Secretary for, Will for President William J. Clinton announced the White House program for a National Moment of Remembrance, asking that on each Memorial Day at 3 p.m. local time that all Americans observe a moment of silence. So in anticipation of Memorial Day on Monday, let us now honor our war heroes by bowing our heads and observing this tradition of respect. We will now have a moment of silence. Thank you.
It has been a privilege for us to be here this evening to take just a few moments in our busy lives to remember the greatest sacrifice of war, that men and women were struck in the prime of their lives so that we might enjoy freedom. Now it is for us to prove that we are worthy of their sacrifice. We have duty, and that duty is to remind those who do not remember. It was MacArthur who said, old soldiers never die, but it's, it is for us to ensure that they that they not simply fade away. This concludes our program. On behalf of the National Honor, S Honor Society, thank you for being here.